Hello, and welcome to the uh, calculus review. We're just going to go over a few things that I think that you're going to know, need to know for me, for the calculus, the introduction to the calculus unit, and then the things that um, you're going to need to retain for the next few classes most of you will be taking next year. So we're just going to go over uh, using function notation to represent and evaluate functions, finding the domain and range of a function. You should know how to do all this. We're just reviewing it. Factoring polynomials and then finding partial fractions and compositions of rational expressions. We already did this year, so this, should, this year we're just going to go over it again and we'll probably do it a couple more times because that's a critical skill for finding integrals later on. Um, so evaluating a function, I just copied this out of the book. If I have f of x equal to the square root of x plus 3, most of you are very good at just substituting this the negative 2 in for the x. So to find f negative 2, I would do the square root of negative 2 plus 3. We get the square root of 1, and I would get 1. So you're good with that. Then uh, f of 6 would be the square root of 6 plus 3, which would be the square root of 9, which would just simply be 3. When I go to do the next one, I'm going to have f of negative 5 is equal to the square root of negative 5 plus 3. That's going to be the square root of negative 2, and that's going to be not possible. That's going to put us into imaginary numbers. It's not going to be a real number. The last one, b, is the one that I really want to talk about. You have x plus delta x. Delta x means the change in x. So when I go to write this, f of x plus delta x, I'm going to do the exact same thing that I've done with the other three. In place of the x, I'm going to write what I see in this parenthesis. So the function is x plus 3. So in place of this x, I'm writing x plus delta x plus 3. Cannot simplify it, so I leave it like that. Uh, so that's how I evaluate a function. If I, the next question um, wants me to find the domain and range. So when I look at this function here, x plus 4, you were taught that in order to take the square root, whatever was underneath the radical sign had to be positive. So the x plus 4 has to be greater than or equal to 0. And that means x has to be greater than or equal to negative 4. So my domain is going to be the numbers from negative infinity to negative 4. Oh, I said that wrong. Yes, I did. Let's go back. Negative 4 is, x has to be greater than negative 4. So negative 4 is going to be the lowest number that I can have. So it's going to go from negative 4 to positive infinity. Uh, actually should have a bracket here because I am going to include that negative 4. I'm not going to include infinity, so I have a parenthesis. Uh, my range, if I think about the parent function, the parent function of the square root of x goes like this. Uh, this plus 4 moves it 4 units to the left, so it's here. But this negative sign makes it reflect over the x-axis, so it's going to go down like this. So my range, the highest I'm going to be is 0. The lowest I'm going to be is negative infinity. So my range is going to be negative infinity to 0, and I am going to include that 0. If you're having questions about how it should go, you can always graph it, and here I graphed it, and I can see that my lowest, this will be the negative infinity part, and then this will be the zero for my range. Okay, looking at the next one, when we have trig functions, can you just forget about trig functions? Trig functions, when I think of cosecant, I like to, I like to rewrite it as 1 over sine of x. So if I look at it like that, when I do my domain, I'm looking for my restrictions of x, so what x cannot equal. This denominator cannot equal 0, which means the sine of x cannot equal 0, which means that x cannot equal, and the values of the sine of x is equal to 0 on one last round of units, therefore 0, pi, and 2 pi. So for my domain, I'm going to say x cannot equal, and then I do n k pi which means multiples of pi. So it can equal multiples of pi. Now when I go to think of my range, well the sine fluctuates, sine of, I know sine x uh, is, fluctuates between negative 1 to 1. That's what the sine of x is equal to. Which means that when I go to do the cosecant, you're doing a reciprocal, which means 
you get those uh, little parabolas, you get things like this. So when I go to do the range, I'm going to have a gap. This is negative one. This is positive one. I'm going to hit. I'm going to go from negative infinity to negative one. Then I'm going to have like a break, and then I'm going to go from one to positive infinity. So when I say my range for this graph, I'm going to say from negative infinity to negative one. Union one to positive infinity, and that's going to be my range. So that's a real quick review of our function notation. The last part that we have to cover is our piecewise functions, which you should be quite used to from your project that you did last year in our WH grade. So if I look at this function, and I what I'm going to do is it, it has two different behaviors. It has a behavior when x is less than 1, and it has a different equation or behavior when x is greater than or equal to 1. So when I go to do this, I'm going to say that f is of negative 3. Negative 3 is less than 1, so I'm going to put it into this formula. So I'm going to say the absolute value of negative 3 plus 1. So I'll have 3 plus 1, and that will be 4. So that's f of negative 3. When I go to do f of 1, well, 1 is my dividing point. So I have to decide which one I'm going to use. I'm going to use the one that says the equal to. So this has the equal to 1, so this is the formula that I have to use. So I'm going to say the opposite of x, which is 1, plus 1, and I'm going to end up getting 0. And then the last one, f of 3, well, there's really no question there. That is greater than 1, so this will be the formula that I use. So I'm going to say f of 3 is equal to the opposite of 3 plus 1, so I'm going to have negative 2. Um, and then if you graphed it, I don't know if anyone graphed this, but if you did graph it, you get a graph like this. I wasn't able to separate it, but if you think of this, 1 is your dividing line. So at 1, which is here, is where the graph changes. So if I were to draw this uh, greater one, I would have an open circle here and going up. And then I would have a closed circle here. And less than, oh, I did that wrong. My bad. Oh, let me go back and do that again. So when x is less than 1, so here's 1, when x is less than 1, it follows this behavior, and when x is greater than 1, there's a closed circle here, and it follows that behavior. Okay. Uh, factoring. I'm going to show you a different way of factoring. Um, if you don't like my way, then don't use it. Use the way that you learned in algebra 2, but my way is a little bit quicker. You're going to cut some. You're still going to do the basic same basic idea, but we're going to skip a few steps. So if I have the product, find the product, I take A times C. So remember, this is your A, your B, and your C. So I'm going to get 60. So my product is 60. My sum is just B. So my sum in this case is 7. Then I sit there and I list the factors of 60 that add up to negative 7. And you could start with 1 and 60. Since the sum is negative, I know the higher number is going to be negative. So then I would go to negative 2 and 30. 3 and negative 20, 4 and negative 15. I'm looking for a sum of 7, so I did 5 and negative 12. And I can stop there because that has my sum of negative 7. Then what I do is I write parentheses, x plus 5, x minus 12. That's where I get the 5 and the 12. Then I go back and I look at my original function. My original function had a lead coefficient of 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a divide by 4 under both of these. If I can divide it, if I can divide by 4, like I'm going to look at this one, 12 divided by 4 is 3, so I'm going to write x minus 3. And I've taken care of that is equal to 3. Good? This one I can't divide so simply because I have a 5, 4, so nothing will go into both. So what I'm going to do is what I call slide. So I'm going to slide this 4 over here, and that's going to be 4x plus 5. Because basically what I'm doing is I'm multiplying this entire parenthesis by 4. So I'd have a 4x and then these 4s are simplifying out to be 5. Then this, these parentheses, the 4x plus 5, x minus 3, will give me the 4x squared and minus 7x times 15. And to check it, you can FOIL it. You have 4x squared, then this would be plus 5x, minus 12x, which would give me that negative 7x, and then 5 times negative 3 would be negative 15. It's just a quicker way. It's easier than writing 
you guys learned to write 4x squared plus 5x minus 12x and factor it by grouping. This just kind of sticks to a grouping step. Again, use it if you like, don't use it if you don't like. Uh, so I'm going to do another one here. This one here, I have x squared, I have x to the fourth, and I have x squared. Since this two is, since x squared squared is x to the fourth, then I'm going to plot something just like I normally would, except for when I go to write my parentheses, I'm going to have x squared instead of just simply an x. So I do the same thing. Oh, there's a big numbers. Um, Sorry about that. I had to go get my calculator. Okay, so I do the product. I put 15 times negative 56. I get negative 840. My sum is negative 11. So I'm going to go off over here. And if you don't know what it is, just start making a table. My product is negative 840. That's a zero. And then my sum is negative 11. So I could do 1 and negative 840, 2 and negative 420. Add these two up, add the digits 8 plus 4 plus 0 is 12, so I know 3 will go in there. So when I divide by 3, I get negative 280. 4 will go in there, and that will be negative 210. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to pause while I do it. You keep on going, and eventually we should find two that uh, differ by 11. Okay, so when I kept on dividing, uh, it was a long process, but you could use some of these little divisibility rules to help you out. I finally get down to 24 and negative 35. Those two differ by negative 11. So those are the two that I'm going to use. So I'm going to start off by writing x plus 24, x minus 35. But this is going to be x squared and x squared because that will give me the middle term of x squared. I'm going to take x squared times x squared. That will give me the x to the fourth. So I'm going to just do that. Now I go back and look at my lead coefficient. My lead coefficient is 15, so I'm going to divide both of these by 15. Now, 15 doesn't go into either one of them perfectly, but I can simplify. So when I look at the first two, I have 24 and 15. Those are both divisible by 3, I believe. So I'm going to divide this by 3, and I'm going to have 8 fifths. So I'm going to rewrite this as 5x squared plus 8. When I look at 35 and 15, those are both divisible by 5. So I divide 35 and I get 7, divide it by 3. And I'm going to have 3x squared minus 7. And now that'll, that'll give me that. Uh, next one I want to do, oh, that's kind of in my way, is if I have, first thing you should always do is look for a greatest common factor. So on this one, I see that I have an x that I can factor out. So I'm going to factor out an x and make it 10x squared minus 21x plus 9, and then I just product from it the way I normally would do. I would have a product of negative, product of 90, the sum of negative 21. And I'm just going back it that way. The, when I go, well, I guess I should just do it. I'm going to take it that I want. So 1 and 90, 2 and 45, these are going to be negative 3 and negative 30. 4? We'll not go in there. 5 and 18, I think. I'm going to, yep, uh, that's not going to be 6 and 6 and 15. Oh, it is plus, so they're both going to be negative. So this is going to be the one that I'm going to use. So I'm going to rewrite this. As I'm going to get this out of the way for a second, I'm going to rewrite this as x. Don't forget to bring down that x, and then this will be x squared minus 6. Oh, just x, sorry, just x. x minus 6, and then this one will be x minus 15. Go back and look at my lead coefficient, which is 10. Divide both of these by 10. These two have a common factor of 2, so this will be 3 and 5. Not forgetting that x, I'm going to have 5x minus 3. 
And you have a common factor of 5, so it's 3 over 2, and this factor is 2x minus 3. And this is my final answer. Do not forget that x or whatever grade you come back with. And then the last one, if you have two only two terms, a binomial, you're going to look to see if it's the sum of two perfect squares or the sum and difference of two perfect cubes. Here I did two, two perfect squares. The square root of 16x squared will be 8x. The square root of 49 will be 7. So I'm going to factor this as 8x, one with a plus sign, one with a minus sign. So that's your quick review for factoring. Oh, I'm on time. I thought I was done. And then the next one is uh, factor by grouping. Uh, if I have four terms, I'm going to look to see if I can factor by grouping. When I look at the first two terms, I ask myself what they have in common. These two I can factor out 2x squared, and I'm left with x plus 4. Looking at the last two terms, I can factor out a 3. I'm left with x plus 4. If you can factor them, sometimes you can't, but if you can factor them, these two parentheses should be the same. So that's what I'm going to factor out of both. So I'm going to factor the x plus 4 out, and I'm left with 2x squared plus 3. Make sure that both of these cannot be factored, and they can't, so you are done. Then the last one is, um, is I only have two terms. Since they're raised to the third power, I'm going to check and see if it's 64. If I can take the cube root of 64, and I can, that's 4. If I take the cube root of 27, that's 3. So these, my A, for, if I'm using that formula, is going to be 4x. My B is going to be 3y. And then you look at the formula, since this is a difference, it would be a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. That's the way this is going to factor. This formula takes care of this sign. So when I think of this b, I'm just going to treat it as a positive 3y because this formula takes care of this negative sign. So when I put in what I have, this would be 4x minus 3y. Then I square a squared, so I'm taking this whole thing and I'm squaring it, so that would be 16x squared plus multiply 4x times 3y, and I'm going to be 12xy. Then take this 3y squared, and I'm going to have plus 9y squared. There is a formula for plus, for um, like a to the third plus b to the third. It's basically the same formula except for changing this to a plus and this sign to minus. This sign is always a plus. All right, now I'm done with factoring. Now going back to your favorite, um, decomposition of partial fractions. This was 7, 4, so if you want additional practice, that's where you're going to find it is on 7, 4. Just to go over the root rules real quick, when you factor it, this is like if I have, like let's just do 1 over x plus 3, x minus 2. These are both linear factors. I would rewrite it as a over x plus 3 plus b over x minus 2, and then I would multiply and say, we'll do a couple. That's the rule for distinct linear terms. So remember, if you had something like, let's say we had something over x squared, x is my factor. I'm thinking about that as x times x. So that is a distinct, that is not a distinct, that is a linear factor that repeats. So the way I do that is I did a over x plus b over x squared. That was a pattern for that one. And then when you have a quadratic factor, so if I had like, let's just do 2 over x squared plus 3 times x plus 1, I would do a over x plus 1 because that's a linear factor. And then my quadratic factor would be this x squared plus 3 because it's raised to the second power. And the numerator in that one would be bx plus c. So let's do a few to see if you remember how to do these. Uh, so this one, when I first look at it, I'm going to factor my denominator. That factors is x minus 3, x plus 2. So to rewrite this, I'm going to write it as a over x minus 3 plus b over x plus 2. Then when I go to simplify this, if I go to add these two, I have to have a common denominator. So the common denominator is going to be what I first factored to, which means I'm going to have to multiply this first fraction by x plus 2 over x plus 2, and the second fraction by x minus 3 over x minus 3. 
So when I do this and I distribute this a times this quantity, I'm going to get ax plus 2a. When I distribute this b, I'm going to get plus bx minus 3b. And that's all over this denominator, which I could write, but I really don't need to. So because I'm going to have that denominator equal to this denominator, it's just not necessary. I'm going to set it equal to the numerator, which will be x plus 7, because this would be the numerator. Then remember we set up a system. We look at the ones that have x. So I'm going to have a plus b. Those are my ones with an x. And that's equal to the coefficient of x, which would be 1. Then I look at my ones that are constants. So I have 2a minus 3b. So I'm going to write 2a minus 3b. And that's equal to my constant here, which is 7. So it's a system I would probably do... Let's just multiply this one by negative 2, so you have negative 2, which is over negative 2a times 2b. So I'm going to have 5 is equal to negative 5b. b is equal to negative 1. Once I know that b is equal to negative 1, I'm going to substitute back into this one. And so I'm going to have 1 is equal to a plus negative 1, so a is equal to 2. To rewrite this, the, the decomposition, I'm going to put those, those back into this. So I'm going to say a, which I just said was 2, so I have 2 over x minus 3, plus b, negative 1 over x plus 2. And that would be the partial decomposition of this fraction here. Those were both distinct linear factors. Looking at this one here, I can factor the denominator. I can factor on x squared. And I'm, also, F, I'm sorry, I can just factor on x. x times x squared plus 2x plus 1. This, fa this can still be factored as x times x plus 1 times x plus 1. So this, these two are a repeat factor because it's x plus 1 and x plus 1. So when I go to write this, I'm going to do a over x plus b over x plus 1. That's my linear factor. And then since it repeats, I'm going to write another fraction where I have c over the x plus 1 squared. In this case, um, this is my lowest common denominator, and we have to add these three. So this first fraction, I'm going to have to multiply by the x plus 1 squared. This b, to get that, I'm going to have to multiply it by x times x plus 1. And then this c, I just have to multiply by x. So I'm going to do that. I'm probably going to skip a few steps. Here we go. Hopefully I won't mess up. I'm going to have ax squared plus 2ax plus a. Because I just distributed it times x, because that's what that's equal to. Then for b, I'm going to distribute a bx, so I'm going to have plus bx squared plus bx plus bx. That's my numerator, and I'm going to set it equal to this numerator. Oh. Okay, my process was valid, but I completely forgot that um, this is an improper fraction, so I would have had to divide the numerator by the denominator first. I didn't do that to you in the burning year, so I'm not going to do that to you now. But know that this is right. I would set it equal to the numerator, but I would have had to divide. And I don't know how to edit. Sorry, Andrew. I haven't learned how to do that yet. So we're just going to go with that and keep on going. So the next one, I have... Uh, this, I'm going to factor out an x in the denominator. I'm going to have x squared plus 4. Now, this is the first time I've had a quadratic factor. So I'm going to rewrite this as a over x plus b over x squared plus 4. But since it's quadratic, I have to make my numerator bx plus c. So uh, then I'm going to go and simplify that. So when I do that, my least common denominator is this. So I'm going to multiply this by x squared plus 4. Multiply this one by x. So I'm going to have a x squared plus 4a plus b x squared plus c x. And that's going to equal 3x squared plus 4x plus 4. 
lumping my terms together, I'm going to have my squared terms, which are AX squared and BX, my linear terms, which is EX, and then my constant term, which is just 4A. So here's my constant, here's my linear, and here's my quadratic. So I'm going to set up an equation that's going to be 3 by 3. I'm probably going to throw in my calculator to solve it. So I'm going to have A plus B is equal to 3. Then I'm going to have C is equal to 4. Oh, I'm not going to throw in my calculator. It's too easy. And then I'm going to have A is equal to, oh, 4A, sorry. 4A is equal to 4. So doing this one real quick, I can say that A is equal to 1. So then we have 1 plus B, that's equal to 3. So B is equal to 2. And then here, C is equal to 4. So going back, I'm going to have A, so we have 1 over X plus B, 2X plus C, which is C, which is 4, over X squared plus 4. And that would be my answer. Okay, that was a really quick review. If you want to do extra practice, I'm not actually assigning extra practice, but if you want to do some, in your calculus book, the book I just gave you, on page 27 is a section for C3. Any problems from 3 to 28 will help you. In the pre-calc book, oops, I need that. In the pre-calc book, you're going to section 74. Now, I know you don't have the pre-calc book anymore, but that book is still available online, so you can look for it there. Um, you have a 10-question quiz on Blackboard. That's what needs to be done by 4 p.m. on Monday. Good luck. If you have any questions, email me. Have a great day. Have a great day.